Thank you very much, Freddy, for this introduction. It's indeed very emotional for me to be here and at the Technion because there is this very special link uh, across generation from my grandfather, my father and uh, myself. Each one in a different role. My grandfather as a lawyer, politician, then my father as a member of, of the French Technion Society and myself uh, as a colleague. So it's really a pleasure of being here. And uh, so the story I'll be telling you about, it's, don't worry, it won't be the family story. It's uh, uh, about work that we've been doing with a group at uh, uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, and more generally uh, about basic issues of uh, signal and uh, image uh, classification. Okay, so let me begin from uh, basic. Uh, the type of problem we'll be looking at are problems of high dimensional signal classification. Namely, uh, you have a, a vector of data, uh, X of D coordinate, typically think of an image with uh, a million pixels, a million coordinates. And in all these problems, the goal are, I'll be looking mainly at classification, you have a certain number of example Xi over there. And for each Xi, each image, you have a certain label, and you'd like to uh, learn the label, the class of any possible signal. So signals can be images, they can be sounds, they can be electrocardiogram, any numerical data you may think of. And the questions, of course, which are behind these uh, problems is, is it possible to learn under what conditions, uh, what kind of algorithms? So the problem a priori looks relatively simple if you think about it. You have a number of examples uh, over there, and then you are given a new signal, a new x, and you want to know the value of f of x. And the immediate idea that comes to mind is to say, well, let's look at the neighbors. You have all the values of the neighbors, and you could just do some kind of interpolation, nearest neighbor interpolation, find out what are the classes of the neighbors. So this very natural idea that works very well in low dimension has a big problem as most of you know, is when you go to very high dimension. So what's the problem? The problem is that essentially in very high dimension, you have no neighbors. Why don't you have any neighbor? Because if you look, for example, uh, the square uh, zero, 01 in dimension D, if you want to have points which are at the distance epsilon, then obviously the number of points you'll need uh, is of the order of epsilon to the power minus D. Now, if you take, for example, epsilon to be 1 over 10, and d is larger than 100, which is not very big, an image is uh, a million pixels, then you already have 10 to the power 100 samples, which is probably more than the number of atoms in the universe, so it's a completely crazy number. So the problem is that you cannot cover your whole space with samples because the volume of the space is much, much too large. So the morality of the story is that when d is large, all your examples are completely isolated, a little bit like the stars in the sky. And you can see it if you look at an example. These are images which are supposed to belong to different class, Joshua tree, beavers, and so on. If you look at the Euclidean distances between these images, in other words, if you just subtract any two images uh, within the same class, the distance is very big. It gives you no information about the class. Two images of two different class are as far away as two images within the same class because the source of variability within each class is huge because the number of variables is absolutely huge. So one of the central ideas of all these approaches is to say, well, in a way or another, we'll need to reduce the dimensionality of the problem we'll need to reduce the volume of the space. Because if the volume of the space is much smaller, then you will be able to cover your space with a limited number of points. And the question is, how can we do that kind of thing? OK, so now, as we've seen in the number of lectures before, a priori, the image is not any signal in your space, or your audio signals, or your electrocardiogram. It's going to belong to a certain subset of your overall space. And if you are lucky enough, your subspace, your subset omega is not too big. So that's the simple case, and we'll begin by that. If you are in a situation where your signal x belongs to a subset omega, which is relatively low dimensional, 
for example, if it belongs to some kind of manifold like that, then everything is relatively easy. You have no curse of dimensionality problem. Why? Because the distance between two points, you will be able to evaluate it with a simple Euclidean distance. You will have neighbors to the point x1 within your manifold if you look at a Euclidean distance. So points are not isolated because they are not spread all over in the space. They are only spread in a very low dimensional domain. If you are in that kind of situation, then essentially the problem you are going to have is to find out where is this domain omega. So you ended up having problems such as manifold learning or sparse dictionary representations. Now, complex images, complex audio signals are not of that nature. Generally, they belong to a subset omega, but this subset omega is huge. The number of variables you have in an image like that is tremendous. Each of the small pixels of this image can vary uh, more or less independently, and therefore, you have a lot of dimension. Same thing for an audio sound. So then you are in a situation where you want to reduce your set omega, but you don't want to lose the information that is going to be crucial to recognize the image. In other words, you will need to reduce this set omega depending upon the property of the function f that you are looking for. So these are called supervised problems because you need to know about the problem that you are dealing with. OK, so if we come back to the problem, we have this domain omega. And in a way or another, we want to contract it. We want to make it smaller. So how are we going to make it smaller? We'll try to find some function phi. And we've been speaking about dimensionality reduction, or rather Guillermo has been speaking about it, uh, Rich Baranu has been speaking about it. But here, I'll be speaking about it in a completely nonlinear framework. You'll see why. And the goal is to try to contract the space so that you have a much smaller volume, but so that you can still discriminate. So what does that mean that you can still discriminate? If you want your function f of x to be, if it's possible to interpolate this function f of x from the neighbor, what you need is that this function f of x should vary regularly within this compressed space. It means that basically you are going to go to, from a Euclidean distance to a new distance. This new distance is going to be much smaller because you compress the space. But what you want is that your function f of x is still regular. If the function is not regular, then you cannot interpolate. So you have to maintain regularity. That will be a key element. So that's a criteria so-called Lipschitz regularity. That means that the increment of x in this compressed space should be of the order of the distance between the two points, the distance being the Euclidean distance between the representation of x minus the representation of x prime. So that will be the condition you need in order to be able to do the recognition. In a classification framework, imagine that your two images, let's say x and x primes, belong to two different classes. So I'll say f of x minus f of x prime is 1. Then what you want is that the distance between the two points, phi of x and phi of x prime, if you write that, should be larger than a certain constant, which is also called the margin in classification. In other words, you want to take your space, compress it, but you don't want to collapse two points which are not supposed to belong to the same class. You always want to make sure that two points which don't belong to the same class will still be far apart so that you can do the classification. OK, so the problem now will be to be understand how we can build this kind of contractive operators for learning. And of course, the idea is you want to contract the space where in the direction where your function f of x is constant. Because if f is constant, then there is no harm of bringing together the points. So the key idea will be compress wherever f is constant. In other words, whenever f of x is invariant. Okay? And another way to see that is to say within a same class, what you want is to reduce the variability of the class. Okay. There is another key idea in learning which is very important and, at first, a bit surprising. 
you begin from your data, which is in a very high dimensional space. You are not going to reduce dimensionality. The first step is going to further increase the dimensionality. In other words, Firefox is going to belong to a space of even larger dimension than X. In other words, your points there, in some sense, you are going to explode them. Why are you going to explode them? Because then you will be able to do a simple classification with a linear operator. In other words, if you have two classes, like the blue and the red dots here, you will be able, in your very high dimensional space, hopefully, to separate these two classes with a simple hyperplane. If you have n points, you can always, almost always, separate them if the dimension of the space is basically larger than n. So, you have this strange situation. You want to compress the space in terms of volume, but you are going to increase the dimensionality of the space. And that's what we're going to see. So, there is one strategy that now most uh, of you know about, which works remarkably well to do such a thing, which are deep neural networks. So, the idea of neural networks is a very old idea. It began since the 50s, but there is a revival which is very impressive, which has been going on for the last uh, five, ten years, in particular with the work of Jeff Hinton and uh, Yann Lequin. And the idea of these networks is the following. So, you begin with your data, which is in dimension D, and we are going to build this very high representation which is at the same time compressed, by a succession of operators. First, you apply a simple linear operator, W1, and then you apply a nonlinearity, which will be typically a contractive nonlinearity. And then you reapply a second operator, and then again a nonlinearity, and you cascade that up to the end, where you are going to get your final vector. And at the end, you just do a linear combination or a hyperplane separation, and you have your classification. Now, what is very impressive about these networks is that they scale. They are implementing networks with million, uh, sorry, billions of parameters, and the results are very, very impressive. So, one classic example now is ImageNet, which is a database which includes over a million of images, thousands of classes, and the error rates is even below than 17, I think around 15%, which is extremely impressive given the fact that you have these thousands of classes not so far from human ability of recognition on these images. Now, what's happening is that now people are developing products all over for image recognition, speech recognition, which was a domain that hadn't moved for about 20 years. Now, the low-level speech recognition is implemented with these neural nets, biodata. All the big companies are now hiring research groups, developing products on these kind of thing. But it's not very clear why. How come these things work? So, the kind of observations that intuitively people have is that when you move along this network, in some sense, you are building some kind of hierarchical invariance up to the point where you'll get a representation which is sufficiently invariant, but which keeps the discriminability so that you can easily do the recognition. If you look at the first layers, whether it's for audio or for images, you can observe that these operators over there, which are totally learned with their gradient descent backpropagation algorithms, looks like wavelets. And I'll say more about wavelets. And again, how come wavelets appear here? What's happening? So, the goal of the lecture will be to try to give an idea of why these things are, in fact, very reasonable, and the very beautiful ideas which are uh, behind these kind of constructions. So, I will uh, divide the talk in two parts. The first part, I'm going to begin from knowledge about the world. We have a lot of knowledge about the world due to the physics. We know about translation, rotation, scaling, frequency transpositions, and so on. And I'm going to show how knowing about this transformation, if you want to use that to build environments, very naturally, you will end up having uh, processing scheme which is very close to these deep neural networks. 
And the second part of the talk, we will be looking about learning. What if you don't know the physics or you want to know more than the physics? How can you learn these environments? So that will be the two parts. Okay, so let me begin with the case where you have a lot of prior information on the world. For example, for digit recognition, typically the recognition is going to be invariant by translation. A four are, remains a four by translation. Potentially invariant by rotation, scaling as is in these textures. But also a very important property, when you slightly deform these objects, they remain within the same class. So you have a stability respect to any deformations or diffeomorphism. So what you want is to build a representation which have the same property, invariant to translation rotation, and it should produce a small distance whenever it's deformed because you want to remain in the same class. If you look at audio, you have the same kind of thing. This is basically a spectrogram. So, Encyclopedias. can you have it higher? Encyclopedias. Okay. These two things correspond to the same words, encyclopedia, pronounced by a, a woman and a man. You see, they look alike, yet they are translation in time, translation in frequency, deformation. Speech recognition is also about dealing with this time frequency, translation, and deformations. Okay, so how can one build such invariant representation, and how does it relate to neural networks? Invariance to translation, what does it mean? It means that if you have your image and you translate it, the representation of the image and the translated image should be identical. So if you take it with a 1D signal, this is very simple to get. For example, what you can do is just register your signal, put the center of mass in zero, and you have a translation invariant representation. Another way to get translation invariance is you compute the Fourier transform, you kill the phase you have something translation invariant. The problem is really deformation. What if your signal is deformed? So these two signals are very similar, but just slightly deformed. If you try to register, so what do you want to do? You would like that the representation of the deformed signal should be close to the representation of the original signal, and the distance should be of the order of the size of the deformation. That will be key for recognition. If you just try to register these signals, because of the deformation, the peaks will not be aligned anymore, so the distance is going to be much bigger than the size of the deformation. If you try to do that with a Fourier transform, same thing. High frequency will move very much because of deformation. It's totally unstable. So the question is, how can you deal with deformation? And that will be the path that will lead us to wavelets. So why wavelets? Because wavelets are functions which are localized. So if you slightly deform a wavelet, you still have something that looks like a wavelet. So let me just remind you. I'm going here to use complex wavelets. So think of a Gaussian modulated by a sine and a cosine. So you have the real part and imaginary part. And these functions, we are going to dilate them by, let's say, powers of two over there. And in frequency, a wavelet like that is like a bandpass filter over the positive frequency, and you just dilate your bandpass filter so you get different frequency band, okay? It's a Q constant bandpass uh, filter bank, if you wish. So a wavelet transform, what does it do? It takes the signal, it keeps the low frequency by averaging the signal, that's the low pass, and all the high pass are carried by wavelet coefficients, okay? I have here no orthogonal basis, it's just a simple filter bank. And if you cover well your frequency axis, you can verify that the energy of all these functions will restore the energy of the original signal. For images, it will be the same idea. So for images, a wavelet is still a complex function, the real part, the imaginary part, but now it's a small image. You are going to take your small wavelet, you are going to rotate it, this is the rotation of angle theta, and you are going to dilate it. So wavelet now is indexed by an angle and by a dilation. So in Fourier, this is the support of your wavelet. When you rotate it, it's going to cover all the annulus, and when you dilate it, it covers all the Fourier plane. So if you do that, then you have a filter, 
uh, filter bank with the low-pass filter averaging and the wavelet transform, same thing, keeps the energy. So the key idea of the wavelet will be, we'll use it to separate the signal information within different scale. scale. Okay, so how now can you compute an invariant? You compute an invariant by taking your signal x and making it as uniform as possible. The only linear operator, which is translation invariant, is the operator which is averaging the signal. So if you want it to be, make it just locally translation invariant, you will locally average your signal. And you see the result here is almost invariant by translation, at least invariant to translation on this translation which are small relatively to the support of phi. Now, if you do that, of course, you've lost the information, but the wavelet transform will also give you all the high-frequency information through wavelet coefficients. But these are absolutely not translation invariant. Okay? If you translate your signal, this is going to translate. It's going to be very different. So what are we going to do? The first phase will consist in precisely killing the phase, like in Fourier transform. So we're going to take the modulus of that. So now we have an envelope which varies more regularly. What did we do? We applied a modulus, so it's going to be a contractive operator. It's contractive because if you take two numbers A and B, the absolute value of A minus absolute value of B, smaller than the absolute value of A minus B. So modulus is a contractive operator. So we're going to contract the space with this contractive operator. And so this new operator now, which is nonlinear, it's not anymore preserving distances, it's compressing distances because of uh, the modulus, but it's also preserving the norm because absolute value is keeping the norm. So the idea will be get an invariant representation and then get the envelope of the high frequencies. So then if you want to take these high frequencies and then make them invariant to translation, you will just have to average these high frequency, and you are going to get a new set of invariant coefficients. To do that, we are going to apply a new wavelet transform. And that's where you are going to see appearing these neural network. OK, let's begin with an image. First, you average your image. You get an invariant by translation. Then you get all the high frequency information through the wavelet coefficients, different orientation, different scale. OK? The wavelet transform explodes the information across scale and angles. Then you are going to compress the space by making a modulus. So you are going to keep only the modulus of the wavelet coefficients. That's the first layer. Now you want to produce a new set of environment coefficients. To each of these images over there, you are going to apply your wavelet transform again. So you are going to compute the average, and you are going to compute the wavelet coefficients of these modulus wavelet coefficients over there. So you have many, many, many new images over there in the next layer of the network. Then you want to make them invariant to translation. How are you going to do that? You reapply a wavelet transform. All these red things correspond to averaged images. They are invariant to translation. And you get the next layer, which are the high frequencies and so on. So you see here, it's a convolution network. Convolution, nonlinearity. Convolution, nonlinearity. And all these outputs correspond to the invariant coefficient, the averages. So what did we do? We've been cascading compressive operator like that. And the output of the network are all these invariant measurements. First, the average of the image, the average of the wavelet coefficient, the average of the wavelet of the wavelet, wavelet of the wavelet of the wavelet, and so on. Okay? You have a huge set of invariant coefficients. That's what we're going to call a scattering transform because it's exploding, it's scattering the information. Now, observe, we begin with x, and we've been constantly increasing the dimensionality of this space okay, while compressing it with these modulus. Because it's a cascade of modulus compressing operator, you can easily verify that the cascade is going to compress the information. The distance between x and x prime in the scattering domain is smaller than x minus x prime. You can prove that the energy of the last layer is going to go to zero, 
So all the information is going, out, going to get out as invariant coefficients. So all the energy of the signal is going to be carried by these invariant coefficients. That's what is said over there to preserve the norm. And very important, it is stable to deformation. If you take your image, you deform it like that, x becomes to x tau, the deformed image, the distance will be of the size of the deformation. So simple Euclidean distance will give you all the information you need about deformation. Okay, let me give you first few examples to get an idea how it looks like on audio. So this is an audio sound, an attack, tremolo, and the vibrato. If you look at the output of the first layer, so these are like meld spectrum coefficients in audio. They all look alike because what you are basically doing is taking this wavelet coefficient and averaging them. So you are losing the attack, you are losing all the tremolo and vibrato information, everything looks alike. If you look at the coefficient in the second layer of the network, these are the wavelet coefficient of the wavelet coefficient. What do you get? you get the fact that here the attack was very smooth, so you have no high-frequency information in the second variable, lambda 2, whereas the attack here, you see it. You see here appearing the tremolo as a high-frequency information in lambda 2, and the vibrato. So basically, all the fine structure which had disappeared appears in the next layer of the network. That's why you need several layers. Let's take images, two textures. These two textures have exactly the same second-order moment. So if you look at these two textures in the Fourier domain, they look exactly the same. The power spectrums are identical. If you, they were designed for that. If you look at the first-order coefficients, these are a display of the wavelet coefficients, a little bit like Fourier. Basically, they give you the same kind of information as second-order moment or power spectrum. They are identical. If you look at second-order coefficients, they are totally different. Why? Because this is much more sparse than this, and you see it appearing through the second-order coefficient. So you see the need of going deeper and deeper in the network. Okay, so how do you use that for classification? Once you've taken your image and built the uh, scattering transform, if you are dealing with a problem, which is just about translation and deformation, then you just do a simple linear classifier. This is the case for problems such as digit recognition, because the digits move around, are deformed, so the problem is totally linearized in the scattering domain, and you get state-of-the-art results, the order of 0.4% errors, which are uh, about, this. yeah, that's right now the state-of-the-art, but in a very simple way, but it's a simple problem. It's a simple problem because it's just about translation and deformation. If you deal with textures, so textures are stationary processes. You want a translation environment representation. Same thing. You build your representation the, exactly the same algorithm than for digits. In that case, you get about 0.2% error. The state of the art was about 1% errors, essentially with Fourier techniques uh, before. So basically, you get the environments the problem gets very simple. Now, what kind of information are you retaining? If you look at audio textures, for example, that's the work of Joachim and Den. So the kind of thing you'd like to do, you take an audio texture, you build a model, and you try to synthesize. So if you do that, for example, with covariance representation, what you can resynthesize is a Gaussian process. With the scattering information, you can build up your scattering vector and you can resynthesize a random uh, vector which has basically the same scattering coefficient. So I'm going to show you, in, for the Fourier, you have about D coefficient. For the scattering vector, I'm just going to use the first layer, the second layer. So it's of the order of log square D coefficients. This is the first example, water. This is the Gaussian model the scattering vector. Can you put it a bit lower so that we... Okay, paper. Gaussian. Scattering. Cocktail party. Gaussian. 
scattering. <laughs> what you see is that basically you are restoring intermittency phenomena through these second layers of coefficients. So you are capturing here information, but that's OK as long, again, as you have something which is stationary, where translations are, is the main driving uh, variability parameter. What's happening when you have more complex problems, which are typically the problems that people are dealing with with uh, these deep networks? Let's begin with just rotation. Suppose now things are rotating a lot or change a lot of scale. How can you deal with this source of variability? The first transform is a wavelet transform. So what you get is the average, but then you get a representation which depends upon scale and the angle of the wavelet. If you want something which is invariant to rotation, you can view that as an image which depends upon your translation variable and rotation, so you have a 3D variable. And instead of doing a translation convolution, you are going to make a convolution both along the rotation variable and the translation variable. In other words, you are going to build a wavelet along space, but also along rotation. You are going to make a convolution, 3D convolution with your wavelet, and you are going to average in your 3D space. Now you are going to get something which is invariant to translation rotation. What if you want something which is scale invariant? You are going to do the same thing relatively to scale and rotation. So the basic idea is that now if you want to use other groups, you are not just going to average, well, along translation rotation, but along the other variables. If you do that, if you just do a, a texture recognition, which is translation invariant, you get about 20% error. Translation rotation, 2% error. Scaling, 0.6%. That means if you adapt to the right invariant, you get what you want. You go to very small errors. OK, what if you deal with a complex source of variability such as Caltech images? So these are different classes. These are the results with a deep network. This is the first layer, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh layer. As you can see, that's the network used for ImageNet. The classification rate improves. These are networks which are totally learned, up to an error of the order, uh, an accuracy, sorry, of the order of 90% for Caltech 101. In what we did, if you just deal with physical invariant, rotation, translation, with a scattering transform, you do as well over two layers than a deep network, but you don't go beyond. Why? Because beyond, you need to learn the source of variability. So the message is basically the first layer of these networks only deal with the physical environments. The next layers begin to learn the environments. And now the last part is, how do you learn the environment? OK, so the problem is the following. You want to build an operator which compresses the space. I gave you the uh, way to compress the space with wavelets. But in general, you can use any arbitrary operator WK which preserves the norm, and you're going to take the absolute value and cascade that. And the question is, how to learn WK? And the condition we are going to impose to be able to learn it is that this operator WK has a small support. And because I'm lazy, we're going to use a very simple operator just with HAR wavelets. So let me remind you, what is a HAR wavelet? It's built very simply by pairing even and odd coefficients, averaging and computing the difference. This is an orthogonal representation. You cascade it. And you get a hard wavelet if you do the cascade. This is the orthogonal wavelet transform. Now, the idea is the following. We are going not to take the even and odd point, but we are going to pair the points. Certain point k is going to be go with a point k prime. And then we average and compute the difference. OK? Now, suppose that you want something which compresses the space. You are now going to take the absolute value of the difference. This representation is invariant to permutation. Out of this representation, you can recover the two numbers, but you don't know their position. Okay? This is basically a hard transform with a modulus. And now the question will be, what are the pairs that you want to associate to do the compression in the right direction? So 
The core idea is going to be the following. Each time we are going to learn the way to do the pairing, so the direction in which we want to do the compression, from the data. And then we are going to apply the transform, difference absolute value, and cascade that. Learn the pairing, learn the pairing, learn the pairing, do this product, you get a scattering transform. It's the same idea, but now you are basically learning your wavelets. Now, if you begin from endpoints, you are going to get here, it's an orthogonal, well, a succession of orthogonal operation modulus, endpoints. We're not going to do it once, we are going to learn several trees. So we are going to increase the dimension of the space. Now, how are we going to learn? The idea of a supervised classifier is that you want to maintain the margin. So you want to make sure that the distance between two points in the representation is always bigger than the distance between the class. So suppose you have four classes, we're going to do the following. We compress, we're going to learn an operator so that we compress the space, but we don't get the class closer. Compress the space, never get the class closer. And how do we do that? By finding the right pairing. The right pairing are the one which don't bring closer the points that belongs to different classes. Okay? And that's done by optimizing a margin distance. Because it's a pairing problem, you have exact optimal algorithms to solve that kind of thing. If you want to deal with unsupervised problem, then you don't have any more the classes. The only thing that you can do if you don't know what class a point belongs to is to make sure that your data is not too much compressed to try to avoid collapsing points together. So in an unsupervised case, what you are going to try to make sure is that your data doesn't get squeezed too much. So you are going to learn the operator so that each time you compress the space but you don't compress too much the data. If you do that, you can verify that it will be equivalent to minimize the sparsity norm. Make a pairing so that the difference between the points are as often as possible equal to zero. So match points which have close value and iterate so that's very close in an unsupervised way to dictionary learning. Okay. To finish, if you do that, for example, on MNIST, but that's the images you have, completely randomly permutated, okay? So you have to learn what are the appropriate pairing. You do that, if you do it in an unsupervised way, you have no information about the class, you are going to learn wavelets, they look bizarre, but if you invert the random permutation, you see basically you are learning wavelets which have almost connected support. They are computing differences within your image, which basically corresponds to contour information. If you do that, you get an error of the order of 0.9% without having any prior information about distribution of pixels and having learned everything. Now, this is an unsupervised approach. What did we learn here? Translation. Why were you able to learn translation without information about the class? Because all the digits are invariant to translation. This is not possible in general. Let me show you a very simple example. Here you have two classes. The blue class, one, two, is signals which are on the left and then zero on the right. The red class is zero on the right and red on the left over there, okay? If you do an unsupervised learning, you are going to get a representation which is basically invariant to translation. That's the Haar pairing that you learn. You group the points which are nearby. Basically, you are learning translation. And if you do that, the error is going to be 50% because if you do a translation invariant representation, the blue and the red class are identical. Here, you don't want to do something which is translation invariant. You want to make sure that the class remains separated. And that's what you get if you do a supervised pairing, which makes sure that the margin distance remains the same. So you compress the space, but you make sure that the distance between the elements remains uh, about constant. And then the supervised classifier is going basically to converge to one. That's a simple example when the number of trees, in other words, when the dimension of the space increase, you are going to have a convergence to 100% error. So, conclusion. 
What I wanted to show here is that behind these deep networks, which looks very strange, there are some basic principles which allow us to understand what's happening. And among these basic principles is this idea that you take the space and you progressively compress it while at the same time increasing the dimension. The fact that you compress the space means you have no overfitting problem. You can have billions of parameters, but because you compress the space, you don't have an overfitting parameters. I think the area is very beautiful because from a mathematical point of view, it's very surprising. It's very surprising because in math, normally, that's not the way you build environments. So there is a lot of things to do. I think there is a lot of things to do also in relation with other fields, in particular with physics, where there is a lot of problems related to environments. This being said, there are many, many possible strategies to do that. People use backpropagations in these deep networks. I just showed a very simple example with just a pairing algorithm, which seems to be able to uh, get decent results on a number of examples. We are just exploring that. And of course, there is a lot of research questions on how to do that depending upon uh, the type of applications. Thanks very much.